Hey everybody, let's go ahead and start taking a look further into inference or quantitative data, looking at means specifically today, and now we're going to be looking at tests about a population mean. So we're looking at significance tests and hypothesis tests, and we want to know how is this process different from conducting a significance test for proportions. So we want to know how is it different than that one prop Z test that we did in the last unit, okay? First thing I want you to remember is that a significance or a hypothesis test is basically telling you the same thing as a confidence interval. So with that confidence interval, we're looking to see uh, if a mean is going to fall within inside of a, a range of plausible values, right? And then we want to assess a claim. See, we have somebody that makes some kind of claim about an average or a mean. And we want to see, does that mean fall inside the plausible values? Is that claim plausible? Well, we're essentially doing the same thing with the significance test, it's just in a different context. And what we're doing is seeing, is that claimed mean that we call mu naught, is that going to be at all different from something that we observe? So that's an X bar. And it's not just the, is it different, we want to see is it a big difference. So this is where that key phrasing of statistical uh, significance comes into play. Statistically significant difference is a big difference, okay? And we always want to start with writing out your given information. So what you're doing here is you're looking through your passage and you're trying to see what's your sample size, what's your population look like, what is the, uh, what is the observed mean that we get from a sample, and then what is claimed to be true. So what is mu naught, okay? And then we might also want to try and find our standard deviation, any of that other information anything else that might be additional to you want to write that. Once we've got all of our, our given information, then we can start to read through and say, okay, well, what is the claim actually assessing? And let's write a hypothesis statement that's going to be based off of that. Remember that your null hypothesis is always going to use that equal to symbol, and it's always going to also use the mu naught. It's going to be using what's claimed to be true. Every single time you're going to not use the sample mean, you're going to use the claimed mean, okay? And then with our alternate hypothesis, that's going to be using just some kind of inequality, whether it's less than, greater than, or simply not equal to. Once we've written that out, we also want to define what mu is in context. Mu is going to be the true mean. When we don't know what that is. We're going to try and let our sample speak for that. Okay. And then once we've got that given information, you might also want to write down your degrees of freedom here and also stating your level of significance alpha. So what comes next after getting all this basic conditions is checking your conditions for inference. And let's think about back to doing the confidence intervals. What were those three conditions we needed to check for population means? It's the same thing that we're going to do for a significance test. We want to know, do we have randomization? So we have to check and write this out in context too. Did you have random sample or assignment of treatments? Talk about what it is you took a sample of or who is being assigned into different treatment groups if you're dealing with an experiment. And then we check our 10% condition. We want to see is our sample size going to be at least or at most 10% of our population. And then we want to check to see do we have a normal population. This is what's known as the normality condition. So remember that there are three different ways that this could be satisfied. Either there's a normal population or the CLT is satisfied. Remember the CLT just says that we have a large sample that is at least the size of 30, but if we have a smaller sample than that, then as long as our sample shows no strong skew or outliers, then we should be okay. And this comes from our sample data. So you actually have to make a box plot. You have to make a dot plot or something like that. And we'll see that in an example in just a little bit. Um, but if there's moderate skew or slight skew, that's okay. But if there's a really obvious strong skew or outliers in the sample data, then that's going to be a problem and we can't, we can't use that as a sampling distribution. So another thing that we want to try and assess here is try and figure out why do we check these conditions in the first place? Well, what we would want to do here with a random sample or assignment, again, this is introducing a chance process. 
and it allows us to say that x bar is going to be an unbiased estimator. And so that means we are going to be able to use a sampling distribution to see what is the uh, what is each sample, how does it behave. And then the 10% condition, we know that's always going to be tied to standard deviation. So this tells us we can use the standard error of x bar formula to see what is the variation in that sampling distribution. And then the normal condition is checked. So that way we know that we can use the t distribution is okay to use for our test, uh, test statistic to calculate that t score. And that actually is our next step. We want to calculate the test statistic and also find the p value. Okay. If you're doing this by hand, then the t score is not going to be that difficult of a calculation. It's not nearly as gross as what we saw in the last unit. So you might be more inclined to do this by hand. It's this formula right here. T is going to equal x bar minus mu naught over s sub x over square root of n. And all of this stuff is actually going to be given to you in your prompt for the most part. Okay, and we might think, well, how am I supposed to remember this? And this is something that's on your formula sheet that you can build. And it's very, very similar to the z-score formula, which you should know and be very uh, comfortable with. So it's very similar to z, which is x minus mu over sigma, right? x is simply your observed value. It's what comes from a, a sample. Mu is the parameter, and that's based off of a claim that we are looking at. And then s sub x over n, well, that's just a standard deviation formula, right? That's the standard error. So all of that is the same, okay? And so if we're looking at this, then we should be able to draw out our normal-ish curve. And then we have three different possibilities of how to find the p-value. And so it's all going to be based off of the alternate hypothesis that we're going to be using, okay? So let's go ahead and explore what those look like. So the first situation is where we have our alternate hypothesis that is going to be mu is greater than mu naught, okay? So this is where we say that um, the claim is too low compared to what we really have, and we're looking at something that we think something is greater than this. So this tells us that when we draw out our curve, we have some claim that is the center of this, mu naught, and then our observed mean is to the right of it somewhere. And then this shaded area in that normalish curve is going to be our PE value. And what we want to recognize is that the t-score really, once we've calculated that t-score, that test statistic, it's the same thing as x-bar, it's just in a different context, okay? Now, if we are looking at a different hypothesis for our alternate, and this would be where mu is less than mu naught, then our mu naught still is in the center, but then the claim, or the uh, observed value, x-bar, is going to be somewhere to the left of it, and we're looking at a left-sided area. And then this is going to be our p-value, okay? So each of these are known as one-tailed t-tests, because we're only looking at one tail of the normalish curve. But we know there's still one other possibility for our alternate hypothesis, and that is that we have mu is simply different from mu naught, from what's claimed. We don't know if it's bigger, we don't know if it's smaller, so our observed value could be here, or it could be here. We don't know. So we have two different t's. We don't even really think about them as x bars as much. We have a negative t and a positive t, and it could be either side here relative to the null hypothesis. And so what that means is that your p-value is going to consist of both of these different areas. So you have to add them together. This is only going to be half of your p-value, and then this is going to be the other half of your p-value. And this is what we call a two-sided or a two-tailed t-test. Now, we had these coincide with uh, z-tests, too, with the one-prop z-test. 
this was this was a possibility as well except when we did it in our calculator everything did it for us okay but we're going to try and do this by hand once just to see what it looks like and try and get you to recognize what's actually happening mathematics wise here and so the big question is well how do i even get this p-value well remember this is like a normal distribution that we have here and when we try and find the area inside of a normal distribution it's kind of like doing a norm cdf calculation so we can do that, or we can use our T table, not the Z table, but the T table, because we are doing a T test. And then we compare our degrees of freedom and the T score, and we find the upper tail probabilities. This is gonna be the top row of our T table. And you're gonna find that the T score that you find that's inside the table, along with the degrees of freedom, is going to land in between two different p-values. So we don't know exactly what the p-value is when we do this by hand. Your p-value is just going to be in between these two probabilities. And then we have to compare that range of possible p-values to alpha and write your rejection statement. Okay? So let's actually take pause now and go take a look at an example of what this two-tailed t-test would look like and doing it by hand. All right, so here's our first example. The makers of Aspro brand Aspirin want to be sure that the tablets contain the right amount of active ingredients. So they inspect a random sample of 36 tablets from a batch in production. And when the production process is working properly, Aspro tablets have an average of mu equals 320 milligrams of an active ingredient. And the amount of active ingredient in the sample of 36 selected tablets is only X bar equals 319, so we see some difference. There's a standard deviation also of 3 milligrams, and we want to know, does this test give convincing evidence at the 5% significance level that the production process is providing the correct amount of active ingredients? That correct word is really important. What does the evidence suggest right now? The evidence suggests that the mean amount is less than what is claimed, but we just want to know are we providing the correct amount, because it's not just about providing... Um, more than or less than, we want to make sure we are like right in that sweet spot of 320 because we know you can get actually poisoned if you take too much of a particular drug or you can also, if you, you're taking too little of a drug, then it's just not effective and what's the point of taking the medication, okay? So that's going to give us a hint about what our alternate hypothesis should be. Now let's go ahead and write down all of our given information. I see that I have a random sample of 36 tablets, so n equals 36, and this came from a single batch, so n is all tablets in that batch. And I think it's pretty safe to assume that's going to be a pretty large number that's going to be more than 360, so we know our 10% condition is going to be satisfied. We had um, a claim that 320 milligrams is supposed to be the amount of active ingredient when the process is working properly. So that tells me that's what's claimed to be true. The other thing that tells me that's the claim is that the other value is told that directly that's your X bar. That's what came from the sample of 36 milligrams. So your X bar is only 319 milligrams. Okay. Now we also had the given information that we had a standard deviation from the sample of three milligrams. And then from this, we should also be able to write out our degrees of freedom. Our degrees of freedom is n minus 1, so that's 36 minus 1 to give us 35. And that's going to come into play when we want to calculate the test statistic in just a little bit. Okay. Next, we want to write out our hypothesis statements. So our hypothesis statement for the null is that the true amount, true mean amount, is equal to what is claimed, the 320 milligrams. And then the alternate is that the true mean amount is just somehow different. And why do we say that? Again, because we're looking at just what's the correct amount. That's what we want to know. Not less than, not greater than. We want it to be right on the money. So we just want to know in our alternate, is it anything less than that? And then we have to define what this is. So we would say that mu is the true mean amount of active ingredient in a batch of tablets. Okay, so once we've got that, we can go ahead and write out our significance level and then start to check our conditions. Well, our significance level, it was told to us to use a significance level of 5%. That corresponds to an alpha of 0 0.05, and now we can check our conditions. And we've essentially already checked our conditions 
maybe mentally in your head or you, you know we've actually already stated it but we had a random sample it's not sufficient to say that it just ran SRS check uh, you have to actually provide some amount of context whether you're writing out the sample size or what it is that you're doing so make sure that you're just kind of being um, complete in this process of checking your random sample then we have our 10% condition that's easy enough to check we can safely assume that our sample 36 is less than 10% of all of the tablets produced in a batch so that's satisfied and then the good thing is our normal condition is actually really easy we don't know our population to be normal but we do have a sample size of 36 so by the CLT 36 is greater than 30 so our CLT is satisfied and that means we are allowed to use the T distribution so now we can go ahead and calculate the t-score. Okay, so let's go ahead and calculate the t-score where we have, I'll do this in different color just to kind of differentiate because this is where the stuff can get a little bit messy, but it's also uh, just important for us to, to keep this particular step organized. So our t-score uses this formula where we have our observation x bar minus the claim mu naught divided by the standard error S sub x over square root of n. Believe it or not, we're actually not going to even need a calculator for this. This is actually a pretty simple simplification process. It just looks gross. So x bar, we know that was from the sample that was 319 milligrams, and then the claim was 320. Okay, that's all from the given information that's all right here. Okay, and then we have S sub x, that was our standard deviation, which was 3, and then our square root of n, our sample size was 36. Well, that's easy enough to do. We can do this, 319 minus 320, that's negative one. And then we have three in the denominator, and in that second denominator, we have a square root of 36, and we know that's six. Now, dividing by fractions is the same thing as multiplying by the reciprocal of the denominator. And the denominator, in this case, is three over six. So the reciprocal of three over six is six over three. And we know that six over three simplifies to two. Negative 1 times 2 gives us a t-score of negative 2. So I'm going to box this in because this is usually a very important value. Negative 2 is going to be our t. Okay? So now what we want to do is we want to draw out our normal-ish curve, maybe with an extended tail on either side. And remember that this is a two-tailed t-test because we use that not equal to symbol in the alternate hypothesis. So that doesn't mean that I'm going to shade in only the left side or only the right side. I'm going to be shading in both sides. And so it's like we have a t-score and a negative t-score. And that's here, and that's here. And these combined shaded areas are where it's going to get our p-value, okay? So we know that that's going to be negative 2, and that's going to be a positive 2, okay? So you think, all right, well, where do I go here? How do I find these two areas and combine them together? Well, we have to look at our p-value, okay? Or we have to look at our t-table to get that. So let's go ahead and see what our t-table looks like. Okay, so when we're looking at our t-table, we have to go back and think about our notes that we needed to compare the degrees of freedom to the t-score that we got. Well, we know our t-score was negative 2, and the t-scores are going to be all these numbers that are inside the table. Okay, so we want to find out which one's going to be closest to that, but with our corresponding degrees of freedom. Remember, our degrees of freedom was 35, or our sample 36 minus 1. But we don't have that degrees of freedom of 35 here. We've got 30 and we've got 40. So what we want to do is focus on the one that's going to be more conservative. And that's going to be the smaller of the two sample sizes that are available or degrees of freedom. So we're going to use this degrees of freedom of 30 and we're going to be looking at this row right here. Okay. And what we want to focus on in that row is, well, which ones are closest to our t-score? Negative 2. You'll notice these are all positive. So we just have to look at well, what's the absolute value of negative 2 and that's positive 2. So we're looking for where does that fall? It's going to fall in between two values. And it's going to fall in between 1.697 and 2.042. So that's the like lower bound and upper bound of our t-scores. And then we look to see what is our p-value that corresponds with that. Our p-value is going to land in between these two numbers that are in the top row. These are the tail probabilities. So it's going to be 0 0.025 to 0 0.05. So somewhere in between those two. Okay, so now let's go back and try and put that together with the picture that we drew. So with those lower bound and upper bounds of the p-values, that shows me that we have here, this space 
is going to be somewhere in between 0.025 is less than my p value which is less than 0 0.05 okay and then this is going to also be somewhere in between that range and what we have to focus on now is that we're considering both of these so what do we have to do with each of these 0 0.025 and 0 0.05 upper bound and lower bound values. We have to add them together. We have to consider both of those possibilities. So I take the 0 0.025 and add it with this 0 0.025 and I get a lower bound for my p-value of somewhere in, in, that's going to be here, 0 0.05. Then I add together the 0 0.05 and 0 0.05 and that gives me an upper bound of 0 0.10. So my p-value is actually going to be in between these two numbers somewhere between 0 0.05 and 0 0.10 now the strictly less than symbols that you see here are extremely important which means that the p-value cannot actually be 0 0.05 it's at its smallest going to be something like 0 0.05 and even if it's that small it's still going to be greater than my alpha it's still going to no matter what be a teensy bit uh, larger than what our alpha is. So since my p-value is greater than 0 0.05, my p-value is greater than alpha. And we should remember what to do when our p-value is greater than alpha. We, reje we fail to reject the null hypothesis. Okay. So now let's pause for a second and think about what this means. To fail to reject the null hypothesis, you might think that they, that means, oh, we aren't providing the correct amount of active ingredient. That's not true. Okay. Remember, what we're doing is we are failing to reject the null hypothesis, which means all we can say is that the alternate is false. We don't have evidence that the alternate is true. There is no convincing evidence that the alternate mu does not equal 320 milligrams is true. So. I can think about that and state this. I do not have convincing evidence that mu is different from 320 milligrams. So I can't say that I have convincing evidence that we're providing the correct amount. I just don't have convincing evidence that we are not providing the incorrect amount. And that's how we want to articulate it. Okay? So this is the long way by hand doing it, but I want you to see now how we can use the calculator to make this just a lot easier. All right? So if we're going to use the calculator, let's go ahead and bring up the calculator page. And we want to go into our menu because that's where we're going to do anything complicated. Let's see if we can't find where to go here. So I see option number six is statistics, and then I see that number seven is my stat tests, and I want to choose that one. And we want to remember which kind of test do we want to do. Well, we're going to do a t-test, so we're going to choose option number two. And it asks us what our data input method is. Well, we don't have the actual data from our sample. All we have are the statistics from our sample, so we choose this one, stats, and we choose OK. And then we want to enter in some of this given information. Well, this is why we write down all the information that we do. We know that our mu naught, that is what was claimed. That was 320. And then my x bar, that was 319. And then my s sub x, that was 3. My sample size was 36. And is this the correct alternate hypothesis? Yeah, we use the not equal to. So that's really simple. Go and hit enter and enter again. And now we have all of our results. And we'll see how this is actually coinciding with what we have. So we have a t-score of negative 2. Hey, look at that. Perfect. We did it correctly. And then a p-value of 0 0.053. And we think, well, wait, does that line up with what we actually have? Let's go back and write this stuff out uh, the way that we should. And let's start to see if it makes sense. So doing a one sample t-test. We had a t of negative 2 and a p-value of 0 0.053. And we compare this 0 0.053 
to the supposed range that we would have 0.05 to 0.10. And sure enough, 0.053 does just barely fall inside of that range. And it's really, really close to that significance level alpha of 0.05. But still, we have to have a cutoff point somewhere along the line. We have to have a threshold where we're saying, nope, don't have convincing evidence, or yes, I do. And so since this is still a p-value that is bigger than alpha, we fail to reject the uh, alternate hypothesis. So this is where using the calculator really is a much more preferred method. Not only is it easier, but it's also a lot more precise in doing it by hand because your t-table is really limiting you to giving you a range for your p-value where the calculator can calculate the p-value very precisely, all right? So let's go back to our notes, turn over to the back page, and we're going to summarize everything that we just did, all right? Okay, so this is the back page of our notes. We just wanna write out the steps of how we would perform this with a calculator. Using your calculator to perform a t-test, you want to go into menu, six stats, seven stat tests, and then choose option number two t-test. This is for a one sample t-test. For a one sample t. Okay. Then you want to make sure you record the following. You want to make sure you write out the name of the test that you're doing. It's a one sample t-test. You write out your test statistic t, your degrees of freedom that are provided for you, and then the p-value. Now the degrees of freedom, you don't really need to write that out if you've already defined it from uh, writing out your given information. But uh, the most important thing is remembering this step. If you are using that not equal to, if it's a two-tailed t-test, then you do not need to double the p-value that's given in your calculator. The p-value is already doubled for you. Do not do it again, okay? So to summarize the whole process, it's boiled down into these seven steps, which can, it's, it's the same stuff you've been doing, okay? So let's not forget about this. It's all the stuff that we've been doing for months now. We want to write out all of our given information. That's step number one. This coincides with marking your text. And then you want to write out your hypothesis statements and defining your true mean, mu. Then you want to state your significance level alpha. Remember, if it's not given to you, go ahead and use the canned one, 0 0.05. And then check your conditions for inference. The thing that you need to pay attention to here, the normal population or the CLT being satisfied, if you have a small sample that is less than 30, you have to draw a picture. That's a dot plot, or you have to draw a box plot or something, histogram. Uh, I'll show you an example where we can do that and how you can try to do it as efficiently as possible. But you have to, have to, have to show this step. And this is extremely common on AP for your response questions, okay? Uh, then you wanna calculate your test statistic by uh, and p-value. You can do it by hand, but using the t-test and the calculator is f by far preferred because that's going to be more precise and it's easier and faster, so why not do that? Um, then you want to compare your p-value to alpha and you want to make your rejection statement. Remember, if your p-value is less than alpha, you reject the null hypothesis. If your p-value is greater than alpha, you fail to reject the null hypothesis. You will never accept the hook. All right, so now let's go ahead and take a look at the last example. I'm going to just go through this quickly. I'm not gonna talk you through it, but I will provide some prompts. I want you to try to do this on your own, but you can kind of follow along with me if you get stuck at any point. All right, let's get to it. All right, so Abby and Raquel, they like to eat sub sandwiches. However, they notice the lengths of the six inch sub sandwiches they get from their favorite restaurant seem shorter than advertised length. Shenanigans. I'm going to try to call BS on that one. So to investigate, they randomly select 24 different times during the next month and ordered six inch sub. Here are the actual lengths of the 24 sandwiches in inches. Uh, what I want to notice for this is that at least everything is put in order. So that's going to make it easy for me to end up having to graph this and punch everything into the calculator. Okay. Now we want to know, do these data provide convincing evidence that the alpha equals 0 0.10 level that the sandwiches at this restaurant are shorter than advertised? Okay, so let's get to it.
All right, you guys, so that is it. I hope you start to realize this actually isn't too much work and it's really more of just the same stuff that you've already been doing. And I think a lot of times with the means, it's a lot easier to interpret and analyze what's going on here. So we had a p-value of 0.012, and that showed that we had a p-value was less than alpha of 0.10. That allows us to reject the null hypothesis and say, hey, sub sandwiches, you are shorting me out on some delicious sub sandwich. You need to make sure that your six inch subs are at least six inches. I have convincing evidence that you are not doing that on average. So it's class action lawsuit time. Let's get some free subs for life. Thanks you guys for watching. Have a wonderful day. I'll see you next time.